Ladies and gentlemen, I told you several days ago in opening statements that in January of 17, the defendant's life began to spiral outside of his, his control. And you got a pretty clear picture about what I was talking about. From the time that Megan left him, to the time that she filed assault charges against him, to the time that she filed for a protective order, to the time that he was charged with stalking her. And now you've seen the lengths the defendant will go to to walk away from that. Mr. Parnum suggests that the defendant was desperately in love with Megan Barricades. I submit to you the only thing that Mr. Jacob is desperately in love is, is with himself. Because that's all he cares about. And I hope you got a sense a little bit about who Leon Jacob is when he was testifying yesterday. And I think the defining statement we've seen so far in regard to who he is and what he thinks about Megan Barricus is, put this bitch in her place. Put her in her place, Mom. Relying on his perception of his mom's powers as a high-profile divorce lawyer, <laughs> put his ex-girlfriend in her place. Because who is this low, middle-class woman from Pittsburgh who wants to come after the great Dr. Leon Jacob. That's the approach the defendant takes towards Megan. That's who he is. And I hope you've seen that throughout this trial, the way that he talks to her. And I don't have to read those text messages again, you'll see them. He called her, I think, an ungrateful bitch. There was some more derogatory words in there. And then she had enough, she left. And you know why. She claims the defendant assaulted her. Now, uh, in opening statements, and also I believe Mr. Jacob mentioned on the stand as well, he made a point of saying that the assault case against him had been dismissed. And here's the, here's the dismissal right here. And here's the reason for the dismissal. Dismissed in lieu of felony prosecution of stalking and solicitation of capital murder. The assault case involving Megan Vericus was not dismissed because of the merits of the case although that was the suggestion the defendant made. That's what he wanted you to think, was I really had no, I had no reason to worry about the assault case because it was gonna get dismissed anyway. Well, it was dismissed because of his felony charges against him. That's the only reason it was dismissed. And that's not the first thing or the last thing you're gonna hear about the defendant saying something that is misleading to you. He was up here testifying for a long time this morning. He was up here testifying for a long time yesterday. And I just want you to consider this when you consider what the things he had to say about his innocence is. This is a misdemeanor assault family member case, a misdemeanor. And look at the things he did in an attempt to walk away from it. A misdemeanor. He is facing life in prison on this case, and he's willing to have his girlfriend kidnapped, have his girlfriend killed, have an email sent to him to present to his attorney who would then present it to a court to get that case dismissed on a misdemeanor. You don't think for a second that same person would take a stand and take the oath to tell the truth and lie directly to you? And we, you know he lied to you. And I'll give you a specific example. Yesterday when Ms. Connect was cross-examining him about the statements that he heard Javier say regarding what Valerie wanted to do with her ex-husband. He acknowledged it. He said, I was standing right there. You can hear him on the tape. I got it. He clarifies in his own mind. He says what, the, what, what Mac McDaniel drove. And then as soon as, that, as, soon as uh, Officer Castro is done talking, he then offers to pay him $2,500 a week for four weeks. He admitted that yesterday on the stand. And when his lawyer directed him this morning, he insisted that the following day, and that even that evening, even that same evening, he knew nothing about Valerie's plans. Well, how is that possible? How how is that possible? I mean, the, there's a transcript here, and I know that there's been a lot of talk about transcripts, and I think you have a good idea why you didn't get one and you won't get one. It's because there's disagreements about parts of it. But this is clear as day. Officer Castro. So she's decided that she wants she wants her ex to be gone. Leon, I got it. So it will be a charge of ten thousand. She brought up a good point, so it won't look suspicious. It doesn't have to be all paid at once. If Zach trusts you, I trust you, but there will be a $10,000 fee. It will be a, a robber. She said he drives a new forerunner. Valerie says Land Cruiser. Officer uh, Javier says a Land Cruiser. Leon says, is that what he's got? Officer Castro says a brand new Land Cruiser, 
carjack him, put a bullet in his head, throw him on the street, make sure he's gone, make sure he's dead, for sure, and then park his truck in one of the apartment complexes, in one of those shitty apartment complexes, when can I expect the first payment? And Zach would probably take the money, or I can take the money. I can give you, Leon, I can give you $2,500 a week for four weeks. That is probably the best and easiest. And that's the conversation you just heard me play. How could he possibly look you in the face and say, that same evening, he did not know what Valerie's plans were for Mac? He's standing right there. The officer just recited it directly to him. He then immediately made offers to pay for that. That is the definition of a party to an offense. The very definition of it. A person is criminally responsible for an offense committed by the conduct of another if acting with intent to promote or assist the commission of the offense. He solicits, encourages, directs, aids, or attempts to aid the other person to commit the offense. That's Mac's case right there. I submit to you that yesterday and today on recross examination, the defendant confessed to being a party to solicitation of capital murder of Mac McDaniel because he did. But he goes further than that. If you recall that next phone conversation, that's the one where he's upset, well, not upset, irate that Mac McDaniel still has Valerie's daughter. And remember, that is the defendant's problem with Mac. Because somewhere along the way, the defendant knows that Mac, and maybe even the courts may get involved, are going to make Valerie choose between her daughter and the defendant. And who do you think she's going to choose? When it comes down to it, who she's going to, who's she going to choose? She's going to choose her daughter, and that's a problem for the defendant. So that's why he calls Javier. He calls Officer Duran, and he says, I want this taken care of now. I want him taken care of now. Do it, and you get your payment. I'm telling you, folks, it doesn't become any more clear than that. Never. It doesn't become any more clear than that. He has knowledge of what the officer is going to do. Now, keep in mind, from the very get-go, he believes that Officer Duran is a hitman. There's no question that they're talking about people being killed at Olive Garden. It's, it's talked about several times. Officer Duran talks about it. The defendant talks about injecting Megan himself, stopping her heart. Certainly, we're talking about death here. He knows what Officer Duran's going to do. And he encourages him to do it. He offers to pay him for it. That is absolute guilt of solicitation of capital murder in Max's case. Case closed. That is it. Now let's talk about Megan. You can get a sense of the nature of the relationship and how the defendant treated Megan by way of what she wrote to him and what he wrote to her in those days following uh, her leaving him, the day that, he, that she claims he assaulted her. And it's very clear if you go through the text messages, and we didn't, even, we didn't even go through them, but they're all in evidence. Come back, I love you, come back for the dog. You, ne you never loved me, you never loved me, you never loved me, and her response is always, leave me alone, it's done. Leave me alone, it's over. Get your stuff, move out. And the emails that the defense suggests are evidence of some lovelorn lover or the, the boyfriend who's pining for his ex-girlfriend, that is classic manipulation. Classic manipulation. Using the feelings that she has for him and may still have for him against her, against her well-being, against her own safety. That is classic abuser manipulation. And that's what he's doing to her. How could you ever do this if you ever love me? Come back to me. I'll take you back. This is a woman that claims to have run out of her house in the middle of the night because she was assaulted by her long-term boyfriend. I will take you back. Because I'm just that good of, of a person. Because I love you that much. That's what he's doing. That's what he always did. Every time she tried to walk away, that's what he did. He used their past relationships and the good times I'm sure they had as currency to buy himself out of trouble every single time, but it wasn't going to work this time because he finally went too far. That was problem number one with Megan. He had nothing without her. She paid the bills. 
She paid the apartment. He had nowhere else to go. But as his problems escalated, so did the options in dealing with those problems. And you heard all about that. From the very beginning, from the very beginning of that Olive Garden meeting, the very first time he talks about what to do with Megan, and you'll hear it the very first time. I don't want her hurt. I just want her to go. I don't want her hurt. I just want her to go. I think he says something in the middle there about how, how she could get in trouble. But the last thing he says in that same phrase, and he, he never stops talking. The last thing he says is, I don't want her hurt unless that's the only option. It's not Officer Duran that puts her, her being hurt or killed on the table. It's the defendant from the beginning because he knows who he's meeting with. And why in the world, if you were ever just having a meeting with somebody about convincing somebody to leave town and this story about how he wanted to give her money, I mean, goodness gracious. If your meeting was just really, the, the topic of conversation was that benign, why are you asking this person who you're meeting with for the first time if he's a police officer? What, what would be the reason for that? The only reason to ever ask somebody who's not holding themselves out as a police officer, if they are a police officer, is that you're about to tell them something about something illegal. That's it. That's the only reason, right? I mean, there's no other reason. He wasn't just curious. He wanted to know. And we know later on, he's still being cautious. He feels Officer Duran up to see if he's wired. If there was never any ill will intended toward Megan, why is he so concerned about being, as he put it, fucked here. And you heard him say that in the recording, I'm worried about being set up and fucked here. Because he's still cautious. Because he, he plays around with words, right? He plays around with words, that's what he does. Just like with the Valerie situation. If he believes he's not at the table making the deal, then he's not criminally responsible for it. Well, we know better now. If he never says, I want you to kill Megan, I'm not criminally responsible for it. Why does he keep using the word prefer? You notice that? He uses that throughout. I prefer that not happen. I prefer that not happen. I prefer that not happen. Not under no circumstances should you ever hurt Megan. I will not allow you to hurt Megan. Please never ever hurt Megan. If you ever feel like you have to hurt, Me hurt Megan, stop it all and let her go, he uses the word prefer. We all know what the word prefer means, right? It means there's two possible outcomes, right? It's acknowledging that there is another outcome that you're anticipating other than the one you say you prefer. That's why he's using that word. Because he knows, like I said in the opening statement, he knows the trajectory of this. He knows the end game. The eventuality of him dealing with Adam is Megan being killed. And you'll see, you'll see that throughout the recordings. And I understand what defense counsel was doing this morning, but with all respect, picking out phrases here and there from conversations that go on three hours don't, doesn't give you a full picture at all about what's happening. When what was said is important. Just like when, when, when Officer Duran told him what Valerie's plan was. Everything he did after that is important because we know exactly what is in his mind in regards to what's going to happen to Mac. That's why listening to all the things as we listen to them when we had Officer Duran on the stand is important because you need to hear everything. Because as many times as he says, I don't want her hurt, I prefer she not be hurt, as Ms. Connect pointed out, there are several times where he's a lot more direct than that. The injection of potassium chloride. Do whatever you have to do. Does she understand it? Does she understand if she doesn't leave what's going to happen to her? I mean, that's as direct as it gets. You got to remember it. Not only does he think this guy's a hitman the day he meets him, he knows he's a hitman the next night. He knows it. He's been told that this guy shot and killed Mac McDaniel in a robbery, or what was made to look like a robbery. And he never puts a stop to any of it. He believes if he dances around his intent and what he really means, 
he can look 12 of you in the eye later on and say, look, listen to the recording. Listen to what I said. I didn't mean that. But you have to look at what he knew along the way and what he didn't do. What does his inaction tell you about what his intent is? Because as Ms. Connect asked him earlier, you could have stopped this at any point. At any point, you could have said, enough is enough is enough. Stop it. I don't want to hurt. As far as the rest of the witnesses in this case goes, Mr. Kubosh, Mr. Kubosh came in to tell you that he was so, he was so put off by his conversation with the defendant, he, he was worried. Now, Mr. Parham suggests that what same person would walk into a councilman's office and say, I'm looking for a person essentially to commit solicitation of capital murder or commit capital murder. Well, what person would walk into a person like that's office and say, I'm looking for Zach because I paid him a lot of money to take care of a problem and it's obvious he's talking about a witness. That's witness tampering. Same difference, right? The fact is, Mr. Kubach was so alarmed by what he was being told, he called the police. That's the reason Mr. Kubosh took the stand. Motaz, the reason he took the stand is because as the state, we have an obligation to bring you evidence. Whatever you think about Motaz, whether you like him, whether you think he had other motives, whether you think he's a con and he was just taking the defendant's money, you can think, of course, whatever you'd like to think. We have an obligation to bring you the witness, but I want you to pay attention to the things he said he told the defendant about how he had been dealing with Megan. And I want you to consider that maybe he was telling the truth about the story about kidnapping because it's referenced later on. In the Olive Garden video, the defendant even says, she was supposed to leave before, he didn't tell you. And there's more than one reference to it. So I suggest to you, Motaz may be telling the truth about that. Laura Thurlow, what reason would she have to lie about any of this? It was necessary to bring these people in to tell you the backstory, but nobody's going to ask you to convict the defendant based on the testimony of Laura Thurlow, or Motaz, or Kubosh. All you need to convict the defendant is his testimony yesterday and today and those recordings. And that's it. That's it. Because as this progresses, you see where it's heading. And ultimately, we know where it ended up. This. <laughs> Now, he tried to explain, and he, he, he was saying that he was distraught or emotional on the phone. You certainly can listen to those, and you, you tell me whether you think he's distraught. I certainly don't think so. But what would the normal reaction be to seeing this if you really didn't have this in mind? He was more concerned about what she had said to him, to Officer Duran, about Leo. So she was just like, fuck him. That was his response when Officer Duran said she's dead. So she, she was just saying, fuck him. What would the natural reaction be of a person who really didn't intend for it to go this far be when he gets this message? And it was actually incorrect when he said, I saw, I saw it and I was shocked and I said, shit. If you go back through the recording, he hadn't even seen the picture yet. Because you can hear in the recording, he's like, let me take a look. That's about 30 seconds later in that whole conversation. So him saying, I said shit when I saw it because I was that shocked by it, he wasn't even looking at it yet. It's clear, it's clear from the audio if you want to listen to that phone call. It's phone call number nine, I think. He did nothing to stop this. Nothing. In his mind, this is reality. We all know this was staged, but in his mind, his ex-girlfriend, who had filed assault charges and stalking charges against him, is sitting by herself in a warehouse somewhere in this city zip-tied, with duct tape around her mouth, with a person he knows is a paid killer. He knows it. And, and there's no disputing this. This is, this is visual evidence, right? That is what he's thinking. And he never tries to stop. He never once says, let her go. He never once said, this has gone too far. Because that was never his intention to stop it. He was going to let it go as far as it needed to go. And if it needed to go all the way, he was fine with that. He made that clear several times throughout all the audio statements. He thinks he can just walk away from this. 
That's the plan. Just like the plan was to walk away from the assault family member case, the plan to walk away from the stalking case, he will do anything. He will do anything. As evidenced by his own statements, I was going to get rid of a witness in a case against me so I wouldn't be held accountable. I, wouldn't, I could walk away from charges. I could pursue my license. I could pursue my life with Valerie. He was willing to present false evidence to a court of law for his own advantage. Him getting up on the road and lying is nothing to him. It means nothing to him. He'll say anything. He'll act any way. He'll do anything. And did you notice the pauses? The, the pauses? When he was asked direct questions that should have been easy to answer, the pauses that he had, I think one of them was, you weren't, you, you weren't suggesting that, the, that the, the officer kill Megan. He paused for like five seconds. Why, why would that take time to think about it? Why would you have to think through your answer to that? If the truth is no, you would have said no before he even, he even finished his question. Because he's thinking about the way that he can spin things that are in black and white in the transcript and are clear on the audio, how he can spin them in his favor. And unfortunately for him, there's just too many. There's just too many to explain away. And you saw that at the end of his testimony. You remember sometimes when he was confronted about things, even by his own attorney, giving him an opportunity to explain things that were pretty damning to him. I don't know what I was thinking. He couldn't even think of an explanation that would pacify what he was looking at right in front of him, that would mitigate how awful the things he said were when he was looking at this. I didn't even know what I was thinking. Oh, helping that, telling that officer how to inject somebody with something that would kill him to stop their heart, oh, that was just drunk silliness. I mean, come on. That's absolute nonsense. You just kind of sh slide everything else away, sweep everything under the rug that you can't explain. And let me tell you how many times I said, don't hurt her. Look at the big picture, folks. That's all I can say. Look at the big picture. Like I said before, in terms of Mac and Daniel's case, it's, it's right there. It's right there. He knew exactly what Valerie wanted. She was sitting right there when the officer said, this is what she wants. This is how we're going to do it. I need the payment. And Leon immediately offers the payment. And that night, he wants it done. And he wants it done right then. That is guilty of solicitation of capital murder, period. With Megan, he had chances to stop it. But he let it go, and let it go, and let it go, and let it go. Until he's looking at that picture. And then when he's arrested that night, he's laying in bed. In his mind, he knows that once again, Leon Jacob has won. Leon Jacob has won again. Leon Jacob got what he wanted again. Mac McDaniel was dead, and Megan Barakas was dead. He finally got what he wanted. That's why he's guilty of solicitation of capital murder for both of them. Because that's what he wanted. Him and Valerie, no question Valerie was involved. No question Valerie agreed to, to, to have Matt killed. Absolutely. But he was right there for that. But Megan was his. Megan was his. And he had every chance to, to put the brakes on. He had every chance to save her life, to let her go. But he started Officer Duran down this path, knowing who and what he was, aimed right at Megan and did nothing to stop him. And that's why he's guilty, folks. And we'll ask you to find him back.